Hi guys, Jordan with Motion Array, and today we're going to be showing you how to add a heads up display to your videos in After Effects. This type of effect has lots of different uses, and you've probably seen it in countless different top budget productions. Everything from a crazy high tech laboratory situation to Iron Man suit and even Taylor Swift's music video, Ready For It, saw this effect used for her bionic eye. And believe it or not, she's not the only person who has a robotic eye. I do too. And with its power, I shall take over Motion Array and use it as a platform to conquer the inter- <laughs> uh, Okay, that, that was, uh, un unexpected. Um, let's, uh, let's take a look at how to do that, um, the robotic eye thing. Transition! <laughs> Alright, so here we are inside of After Effects, and we're going to be recreating the eye heads up display effect that we just saw in the opening example. We're going to be going over three basic steps of compositing this effect. We're going to be starting with the bionic eye effect, and compositing that to make it look like it's actually really there. Then we're going to create the grid scanning effect, and then we're going to composite the heads up screen display in front of the eye. And then throughout the whole thing, we're going to be working at adding a little bit of flair and a little bit of polish to make it look as good as possible. So let's jump into it. Let's start by taking a look at our footage. The footage that we're using is just a simple shot of an eye. And it's important to make sure that if you're shooting this yourself, that you keep the iris in focus. Drag and drop your footage over top of the new composition button, and it'll create a new composition based on the parameters of your clip. And then I'm just going to clean up this clip to only include the pieces that I know I'm going to use. Because this effect is going to be working our computer pretty hard, it's best to save as many frames as possible if you know that you don't need them. Let's quickly take a look at the graphic we're going to be placing over top of the iris. It's this bionic ring here, and I downloaded this from motionarray.com. If you want to use something else, that's totally okay, or you could even make your own elements. Drag and drop this over top of your existing footage, and you should be able to see that this is going to take some work to actually place over the center of our eye. Step one is to just get it roughly in place. Decrease the scale, and then position it over top so that it looks like it's actually a part of the iris. Great! It's still far from complete, but this is just the first step of many. You can see the first problem is that it's actually not tracking along with the eye. It's staying in place while the eye itself continues to move around. So we need to track the eye so that we can match up the graphic to follow it. We won't be going over how to track objects inside of After Effects because we already did a video on it. It's this one here, and the link to that you can find in the description below. So with the pupil of our eye tracked, this is what we should have. And now that your null layer has all the tracking data that we just found, you can click this box here and parent your circular graphics to follow the null layer. Now your graphics should be sticking to the eyeball as if it's actually a part of it. But you should see something right off the bat here, and that's that the graphic is actually spilling off of the bottom of the eye, and it doesn't look realistic. And the same thing happens when we close the eye. You can see that there's some spill over the top of the lid now. So what we need to do is highlight our graphics layer and then use the pen tool to mask around the area of the eye. Now whatever we've selected, inside of that mask is the only place where the graphic will actually show up. And now when we drop down the mask option here, and keyframe the mask path, and then move our playhead forward in time, now whenever we make changes to the mask shape, it will actually keyframe and animate over time, making it look like the graphic is actually being blocked when the eyelids are closed. Make sure to scan through your entire clip and make sure that at any point in time, this effect looks believable. You can also zoom in to get a closer look for some fine details. And we can see here that it's a bit of a harsh cutoff. So by going down to our masking settings, we can increase the feather to make it look a little bit more like this is a natural roll off within the eye. And even down here at the very bottom, you can see that there's this natural line that our graphic is blending into. When you increase the feather, it might bump it over the edge of your mask, so pulling it back with the mask expansion can really help to reduce any spillover. And you can start to see that this effect is really starting to take root. It actually looks somewhat believable. And now that we've gotten past this threshold, I'm going to start adding some effects that are a bit more for fun and for an exaggerated effect rather than for true realism. 
we're gonna be adding a really deep blue glow to the eye to make it look like it's robotic and being illuminated by some sort of light back within the eye. The base of this effect is actually just a solid color, and it's a really simple effect to create. So start by right clicking and going to new, solid, and choose the color of the iris that you actually wanna create. Mine is just gonna be a light blue. And this should create a blue over top of your entire screen. Make sure that it's below your graphical element and not above it. Next up, we're gonna use this solid to create a perfectly blue circle. So go to your ellipse tool and hold control and shift and click and drag to create a perfect circle, roughly the size and shape of your iris. Place it over top and then you can use the mask controls to increase the feathering on your circle just slightly. And then you can use the mask expansion to either grow or shrink your mask to fit. Then when you parent it to your null object to follow the motion of your eye, this is what you should have. It still looks pretty gross, but we're far from done. You can see that this blue circle is suffering from what our other graphic was before, spilling over the bottom of the eye. So we just need to take the pen tool and create a similar mask like we did before, outlining the eye to make sure that it won't spill over the bottom. But by default, your mask should be set to add. So this is gonna include it within the whites of the eyes. The solution, set it to subtract and then click invert. Now it's acting as a boundary to make sure that it only stays within the parameters of the eye. Now you can do some simple cleanup by adding a bit of a mask feather and making sure that throughout the duration of the clip, this effect isn't broken by the closing eye. A simple fix for this is just by going to opacity and keyframing it so that it only starts to show after the eye is already open. Now here's where we start to take the effect from just looking gross to actually looking pretty nice. Go over to your modes over on the left, and if you can't see them, you might have to toggle this switch at the bottom. So once you've done that, select the blending mode called Overlay. And now you should have the same texture of your eye still present, but it's just got a nice new coat of paint on it. Okay, now is the part where we start to get into smaller and smaller details that make a big difference. You can see here that our effect is completely covering the center pupil here, but pupils are pure black and not really blue. So we're gonna create a mask over top of the pupil here by holding Control or Command and Shift and clicking and dragging to create a perfect circle and then set this mask to subtract. Now the pupil is perfectly black and we can add a bit of a mask feather to make it feel a little bit more natural. Great. So you can see that in under 10 minutes, we've already taken this effect from looking like normal footage to looking actually kind of cool and a little bit like a robotic eye. Next up, what I'm noticing here is that the white circular graphics are standing a little bit out too much, like they're drawing attention to themselves. We can blend it in by going to our blend modes and selecting overlay. This helps the background texture of the iris shine through a little bit more through the graphic. All right, next up, what I wanna do is make it look even more like this eye is robotic. So what I'm gonna be doing is taking this blue outline of the iris and making it flicker a little bit. This is what it looks like right now on its own, just fading into existence and remaining constant. So I'm gonna go down to opacity, shortcut key T, and we're gonna find the point where it actually reaches 100%. Then we're gonna make a cut here with controller command, shift and D. Next up, we're gonna take this top iris layer and we're gonna get rid of all the keyframes for opacity. And what you should notice is that even though these are technically now two separate clips, they act as one single unit. Now we're gonna hold alt and we're gonna click on opacity and we're gonna input our own simple expression. Wiggle, open bracket, six, comma, 32, close bracket. And what we've told this top iris layer to do is six times every second to change the opacity up to a maximum of 32%. You can get the feel for what the effect is going for, but let's take a look in the context of our actual footage. The effect is starting to take shape 
But the nice thing is that we can do this exact same thing to our circular graphics layer to really sell this effect even more. Just input the same expression. Wiggle, open brackets, 6, comma, 32, close brackets. So now both the blue iris and the circular graphics are both flickering at a similar pace. But because we've created this somewhat artificial light source in the eye, it's going to be really effective to create this idea that there's a bit of a glow around the eye. So right click and go to New Solid, and with the same kind of color selected, and by renaming the solid to let us know that it's the eye glow, we can use the ellipse tool yet again to create this oval shape over top of the eye. Place it so that it's centered over top of the eye, then I'd suggest maneuvering it so that it fits a little bit more of the curvature of the face. Before you get too far, it might be helpful to decrease the opacity of this solid layer so you can actually see through what you're working with. By making new points and fitting around the curvature of the eye socket, you can actually make it look a little bit more like this glow is going to be interacting with your actual face structure. Next up, let's go down to the masking options and we're going to increase the mask feather. But the effect is still way too much, so we're going to decrease the opacity until it's just barely visible. More of a subconscious hint rather than a big obtrusive glow. Next up, we're going to be taking the opacity layer of the eye glow and making sure that it keyframes in when the glow is actually supposed to take place. When the retina is not lit up, we want the opacity of the glow layer to be set to zero. So now that it fades in, we should see that there's this little ominous glow when the retina actually lights up. I'm just going to quickly rename these iris layers to actually say the fact that they're a blue iris. As we start to add more and more layers, it's going to get more and more complicated to keep track over everything at a glance. So keeping everything nice, neat, organized, and named properly is essential. Okay, so up next, we're actually going to make the glow layer flicker at the same pace as our iris layer. Right click on your eye glow layer and hit pre-compose. Move everything to the new composition and make sure it's named so that it still makes sense. Now that this layer is pre-composed, we can make it flicker without interrupting the fact that we faded it into existence with opacity keyframes. But instead of creating the same wiggle expression that we did before, we're actually going to go to this pick whip under the opacity of the eye glow and parent it to the opacity of the blue iris layer that we had already flickering with the wiggle expression. The result is now that they match to be exactly the same pace of flickering. And let me show you by actually adding in the iris layer as well. They work together almost as a single unit now. These lighting effects are starting to make the effect look even better, but it's missing one important thing, a lens flare. We're going to be creating our own fake anamorphic lens flare by right clicking and going to new, solid, keeping the same color, and to stay organized, let's rename it to lens flare. Go up to your shape tool and choose the rectangle. Create a really long skinny rectangle, and then place it over top of the center of your eye. Now with the pen tool selected, create some extra keyframes along these points of the eye, around the iris in specific. And bring each of these points towards each other so that around this point of the eye, there's actually really no blue part showing through. Then on the far edge here, what you want to do is you want to take the top keyframe, bring it down a little bit, and then delete the bottom keyframe. And then do the same thing for the other side. You're creating this natural little fall off where it gets skinnier towards the far edges of the frame. This doesn't really look like a lens flare, does it? Well, don't worry, we're not quite done yet. Underneath the masking options of this layer, what you want to do is add a lot more mask feather. It'll take a little bit of trial and error mixing between mask feather and opacity of the overall clip to try and get the right looking effect. What I found works for me is by decreasing the opacity by a lot until it's almost not even visible. 
It's less about making it look crazy and awesome, and more about making it look like there's actually particles that are interacting with your effect. And once you have something that you like, make sure to keyframe the opacity so that your lens flare actually fades in at the same time that your eye is lighting up. Next up, split your clip again using Ctrl or Command, Shift, and D. And then take this new layer up here, get rid of all the keyframes, precompose it, and then we're going to add the same flicker effect that we did before. Taking the pick whip here and parenting it to the opacity of our blue iris 2 layer. So now we should see that this effect is actually giving a true flicker to our lens flare as well. And this is what the lens flare flicker looks like on its own. Cool. Okay, so now this effect is more or less complete. We have the eye lighting up, it has a bit of a glow around it, it has a bit of a lens flare, and all of those elements are flickering in unison. Okay, next up on the list we have this effect that looks more or less like there's a grid scanning across the iris of our eye. To start this off we're going to be actually creating a simple grid effect to begin with. To do that, right click over here on the left hand side and select New, Solid. And it's important we want to choose a black solid. And then let's rename this layer to say Grid, to keep things organized. Now over on the right hand side, we need to select the Grid effect. Select it from Generate, and then place it on top of your Grid layer. You can see that an automatic grid pops up, and we need to change it from Corner Pin to Width and Height. Set the Width and Height each respectively to 30 and 30, so that now we have a bunch of tiny square grids. I'm going to also decrease the border size from 5 to 3, to make each line a little bit thinner. And finally, I'm going to add a bit of a glow effect onto that same layer, to make the grid look like it's actually glowing. The default glow effect right now is actually good enough without any changes, so I'm just going to leave it as is. In order to isolate the grid to only the iris of our eye, we're going to be doing like what we've been doing all day long and creating a perfect circle over top of the eye. But before we can do that, we need to pre-compose our layer. Right click, select pre-compose, and move all the attributes to the new composition. Now we can safely take our trusty ellipse tool, and hold Control or Command, Shift, and click and drag to create a perfect circle over top of our eye so that the grid is only contained to this specific place. Next up we're going to rinse and repeat the same process we've done twice before now, create two new masks, one to cut out the pupil to make it completely black, and then the other one to make a boundary for the eye, to make sure that the grid doesn't escape past the lids of the eyes. Add some mask feather to make it a little bit more believable, and then we're going to pre-compose this grid layer yet again, moving all attributes to the new layer. It's at this point that we can parent our grid layer to follow the null layer, which is going to follow the motion of our eye. Now that the grid is actually locked on to the same placement as our iris, the actual scanning effect is as simple as creating a mask and keyframing it from left to right. Let me show you. Find the place where you actually want the scanning to start, and place your playhead over top of it. Next, we're going to create a mask using the rectangle tool. Make it as thick as you actually want the scan lines to appear, and position it off screen either to the left or to the right, I'm just going to stick with it to the left. Then underneath your masking options, keyframe for the mask path, move your playhead forward, and then move the entire mask over to the right. And you'll notice that this scanning effect actually takes place as we move from left to right. 
Now all that's left to do is just to make sure that the speed is actually what we want. Right now it's a little too fast, so moving the keyframes apart from each other will slow it down a little bit. A little bit more, and this should be pretty good. And that's the effect that we were going for. Nice! Now, if you really want to, you can actually cut out the pieces of the clip that you don't actually need, because the effect is only taking place within a small region. And finally, we're going to be incorporating the heads up display layer in front of our eye that you saw in the example clip. So let's go back to our project manager and drag and drop in the heads up display that I downloaded from motionarray.com. Scale and position this to your liking over top of your footage. And what you should notice is that instead of being transparent where there's no actual elements, it's black. So to get rid of this, we're going to go down to our blend modes and we're going to select screen. Nice. Okay, so now that the element is actually looking like it belongs, let's position it so that it's directly centered over top of the pupil. It's really easy to make it centered if we take the numbers here and use that as the center mark. This will make everything look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. This heads up display also has an animation that animates in, so I'm going to take this and make sure that the start of it actually starts where I want it to pop into existence. And to make sure that it moves around with the eye as normal, make sure to parent it to the null layer that moves around with the eye. Instead of just fading this element in, we're actually going to make it zoom out from the eye. So go down to your transform options, and bring it to the start where you actually want this effect to become first visible. Set a keyframe for scale, and position, assuming that it's going to make any left to right movements and then move it forward and set your new keyframes for your ending position. Go back to your start keyframes and then scale down your elements to the very, very smallest you want them to be. Pretty much non-existent. I personally don't need my position keyframes to adjust at all, so I'm just going to get rid of them. Then I'm going to go to my ending keyframe, right click and go to keyframe assistant and easy ease in. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the first keyframe and easy ease out. Select both of these keyframes and then select the graph option, where you can see your keyframes on a graph and have a little bit more precision. Select one of the keyframes and drag out this little line here. Do the same for the other side and you'll see that you're giving your keyframes a bit more of an exponential curve. This will make your zoom out a little bit more realistic as it zooms in and then stops at a little bit more of a gradual pace. Play around with it until you get the final effect that you like. Now that we've got the motion down, we're going to be adding some style. Specifically, we're going to be giving a bit of a lens bow to this heads up display. Go over to the right hand side under your effects and presets and search for CC lens. Drag and drop this onto your layer. And you should see that it adds a bit of a spherical effect to your heads up display. By bringing the convergence down to about negative 200. And then bringing the size back up to something closer to 360. You'll see that you have a bit of a natural bowing to the edges of your effect making it look like it's wrapping around the eye just a little bit. Next up, we're going to be duplicating your heads up display layer twice. Control or Command D to duplicate it once, and then do it again a second time. Each of these duplicated layers is going to serve a different purpose. So let's rename the top layer by going to right click, renaming, and calling it HUD display. Do the same for the second layer except this time call it HUD Glow. And for the bottom layer, rename it to HUD Shadow. You can probably guess what each of these different layers is going to serve a different purpose for. The top one is just going to be our normal display, but the second layer we're going to add a glow to. So in effects and presets, search for glow, 
and drag and drop it onto the HUD glow layer. You can see that right off the bat, the preset is actually doing a pretty good job. But we're also going to give it a bit of a boost by searching for Gaussian Blur and dragging and dropping that effect on as well. Increase the blurriness to a really high amount, probably around 54 or so. And you can see what a difference this makes. Lastly, we're going to go down to the HUD shadow layer and we're going to solo it. Search in your effects for something called invert. And you're going to drag and drop that invert effect onto your HUD shadow layer. This will make it almost completely white, except the parts that are actually the element are going to be turned black. It's basically just inverted everything, like the name suggests. I'm just going to hide the top two layers so it's easier to see what's going on. We're going to take the blend modes, and we're actually going to switch it from screen to multiply. And this will get rid of the white and leave the black elements. You can see where we're probably going with this. We're going to create an artificial shadow. So search in your effects for a Gaussian blur, and we're going to make this bottom layer really blurry to mimic the look of a shadow. Increase the blurriness as much as you possibly can while making sure that you can actually still see it at some point. Increasing the blurriness too much can actually basically fade it out of existence to the point where you can't even see it. So choose a happy medium. For me, it's about 29. But our shadow shouldn't be in the exact same place as our normal heads up display elements. It should be a little bit offset. So I'm going to take the end keyframe for position and shift it down a little bit so that it's a little bit smaller, making it look like the shadow is actually farther away from us as an audience than the actual heads up display. It's very subtle, but you can see it when I toggle it on and off here. That's the benefit of actually using duplicated layers to pull off these sorts of effects. The motion and all of the animations that are a part of the heads up display are actually going to translate through into the shadow. So let's take a look at what our effect looks like from start to finish so far. That's not too bad actually. Nice. Next up, all that we have left is actually just the icing on the cake. Right click and go to New, Adjustment Layer. We're going to help set the tone for this effect by dragging and dropping the Lumetri Color effect onto this Adjustment Layer. Now everything that's below this Adjustment Layer will take hold of whatever color and lighting changes we make. So if we make the scene a little bit darker and play around with some of the curves a little bit, we can see that everything takes hold of the Lumetri color changes. Everything from the base footage layer to the actual heads up display elements, the lens flares, the glows, everything. One thing that I'm going to take special note in doing is by taking the hue saturation curve here at the bottom and by increasing the saturation of the blues in specific. This will keep the rest of the scene pretty much exactly the same but will intensify the blue of the iris and the lens flare, etc. Then conversely, I can take some colors that I don't want to eliminate, but I just want to pull back a bit and draw those down here with this same curve. Lastly, I'll go back up to the project manager here and I'm going to choose this dust overlay. This will just give a little bit more of a moody atmosphere. And yes, I downloaded this too from motionarray.com. I'm going to list all of the elements that I downloaded from there in the description below. So drag and drop this on top of all of your different layers, including over top of your adjustment layer, and set it to screen to get rid of the black elements. Then decrease the opacity so that this effect isn't just overpowering everything else. Now our effect is essentially complete. We can leave it here if we really wanted to, but there's two last things that I really want to do before we call it quits. The first is to add a little bit of a central focusing to the effect that we have in the center. Right click and go to New, Adjustment Layer, and instead of doing a color correction, we're going to actually add a bit of a gradient around the edge of our footage. Making the outer rim darker focusing everything more towards our effect. And I'm going to be doing this along the same ridge line that we did the glow effect. This is intended to make it look like any shadows that we create to draw people's attention to the center could be explained as being natural shadows that you would see in a moody lighting setup. 
So once you have the mask complete, search for the Lumetri color effect again and drag and drop it onto this new adjustment layer. And make everything a little bit darker. And because our mask is still set to add, the inside of the mask is getting darker instead of the outside. So go down to your mask properties and select invert. Or subtract. And then increase the mask feather a lot. And now if we toggle on the before and after, you can see what a difference this actually makes. It really draws your attention towards the center where the effect is taking place, and it doesn't look too unnatural. And lastly, the final piece before we're going to call this effect quits is something that you should remember on any project you work on in After Effects. By selecting Enable Motion Blur here, so that it's blue, and then selecting the toggle switch down here, you can turn on every single layer to have Enabled Motion Blur. This means that if there's any scaling or position movements that you've created during this project, After Effects will actually calculate whatever natural motion blur will look best. And so, with all of that out of the way, this is our true and final effect. Guys, thanks so much for sticking with us through this longer than normal tutorial. I hope you found it helpful and like it helps you understand a little bit more about how to use heads up display elements and how to composite them into a world that actually makes sense. But guys, that's it for me. Like I said before, I've listed all of the effects and templates that I downloaded from motionarray.com in the description below. And if you found this tutorial helpful, we've got tons of others for both After Effects and Premiere Pro, as well as filmmaking in general. Check them out right here at motionarray.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video.